Okay, so one of the things that we talked about was uh, Revelation. Uh, not the book of Revelation in the Bible, but Revelation in, as a broad category, uh, God revealing Himself. <clears throat> so if we kind of take this in order, before we talked about Revelation, God revealing Himself, we spent some time talking about what? Well, that's, that's what the Bible is, Revelation. So what did we talk about before the Bible? I know, that's going back a few weeks now, so... The existence of God, which is interesting, isn't it? Because one of the ways we understand the existence of God is the Bible. However, has God revealed himself uh, in, in other ways, even, even outside of the Bible? Yeah, we call that the general revelation, right? So before we even talk about revelation, we talked some about the existence of God. Tonight we're going to look more thoroughly at, at the attributes and the uh, revelation of God, what God is like. And this is really fascinating. I'm excited about this. So in going in order, we kind of gave an introduction to Christian theology and why it's important for today. We looked at the existence of God. We looked for a while at, uh, <clears throat> you know, what our worldview is. And, and, and what the worldview of our culture is, then getting into the existence of God and from there talking about God. Because Christianity says that there is a God who's involved in this world and He can actually interact with people. He can actually uh, be a part of the things here in this world. That's called theism. So now, tonight, we're going to continue on all that foundation and we're going to talk about what God is like. What I want to say again is that we're always assuming as Christians that God is a personal God, that we're not looking at this like math uh, or like some abstract subject where you just think, well, you know, this is theoretical. We're, if, if you were trying to talk about humans, all right, you could in some way just look at humans as abstract things, right? If we just said humans, you know, have a head and they have arms and legs. But would you just say that's all humans are? Is just some of those outward things you look at? No, you look at them in a personal way, right? If, I, if you were talking about someone who you loved, you know, there are things you could describe about them that aren't just ideas to you, they're very personal, they mean something to you. So when Christians talk about God, we're talking about it personally, as in this is someone that we can have a relationship with. Now, by way of introduction, you've got a lot of notes there, uh, so we'll, we'll get through what we can tonight, but by way of introduction, before you fill in any blanks, I wanted to mention that uh, there's a book that I thought of, it's, and it's one of my favorite book titles. Just the title is one of my favorites. It's What We Can't Not Know. <laughs> and there's this idea uh, that the author's bringing out that there are certain things within us that are innate to us. You can't not know them. However, he's also the author. His name, uh, I had to actually put it up here because it's really hard, to, really hard to spell. J. Budjazeski, I think is basically how you say it. That's how I'm going to say it. And he actually, in talking about himself and his journey spiritually, he talked about actually denying God at, at one point in his life. And uh, here's what he said. This is really interesting. And before you take offense at this, you need to know that it's actually what he said about himself. He said that there are some forms of stupidity that one must be highly intelligent and educated to achieve. And he's really talking about himself there that you can get so wrapped up in your, in your education, wrapped up in your own intellect, that you can miss simple things, or even choose to miss simple things. It's a very soul-searching idea. So we're going to try to hit on this some tonight, but where did everything come from? We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, when we talk about God, there's this innate sense, there's things that we just kind of innately are pulled toward as human. Even the idea that there is a beginning, right? That there is a beginning. Now, science is talking about that, <clears throat> and that's actually a very big topic in science today, but there's kind of an innate sense that there is a beginning. 
And, and so that raises a lot of questions for us. Where does it all begin? So when you look at the world, and I have in the background here the universe I pointed out before, those are galaxies, and you know how many stars just in our own Milky Way galaxy, how incredible that is. And then to think that that's just one small part of the sky. Those are all galaxies out there, and the stars are light years apart from one another and, you know, countless light years away from us. But there's also a sense I have, does anybody recognize what that is? trying to depict the Ten Commandments. There's this, and that's part of what Jay Bajetsky says is what we can't not know. We have a moral sense. We have a moral sense. Do you have to uh, convince some, someone uh, that things are wrong or right? Now, we will argue as humans about whether we were wrong or right, but there is an eight sense that there is wrong and right. And even when someone says, I, I don't believe in morality... It's amazing how quickly they hold you to a standard if you offend them, okay? So we, we have this innate morality. Also, there's the miracle of life. I mean, it, you know, and I remember the, when, when our first child was born and it, and it struck me even back then that the doctors and the nurses, even though we live in an age of modern technology, you know, honestly all the machinery, all the, the, the things that we're able to do. It's, it's pretty cool what we can do today, but it still doesn't compare to this. It's still, even the nurses who've delivered hundreds and hundreds of babies, they look at that, and you can just see all over their face, this is something precious, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And what's behind it is, you know, does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Trying to be? DNA. Do we really even know the extent of, uh, of what it takes to make life. I mean, we're, we're, you know, it's like the universe is just so vast, even when you get down to the, the molecular and the submolecular level, it's just so amazing. And so as I pointed out before, where in our experience does information come from? I mean, even just you have notes and I have a book here this is information. We recognize it as information. Where does information come from? Now, if you, you know, depending on how you're thinking about this, you're, well, it comes from a printing press. No. Where does the actual information come from? Because what's, what we mean by information is something that you can actually say contains ideas that are encoded, that actually mean something and do something, right? They actually have real meaning, that you're able to decipher and use. Well, DNA is that, right? So where does information come from? It comes from mind. In our experience, any experience you have, if you see information, you assume there's mind. So where does DNA information come from? It's very logical, and I think there's something innate within us that would say, yes, there has to be an explanation. Now, some people, again, back to my quote, you can, you can try to explain this away. And there are some great minds that have tried to give explanations, but I think innately we sense that, well, wow, all of this is pointing to something. All of this is pointing to something. And so this is where, again, we're entering as in a Christian theology, talking about theism, that there is a God, and that God reveals himself. And so the Bible says it this way, in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that idea of Word resonates with us as people, because how do we relate to each other? It's through our communication, through our interaction. And what is the Bible telling us? That God interacts. And it even is saying there, and we'll look at this more, of course, because it's Christian theology, God actually enters, right, and interacts with us physically in Jesus. So we'll look at that more. But we're not there yet. So one thing I want to say off the bat, though, with all this, uh, as we get into filling out these attributes, be very careful. And I think for people here, uh, most, most people here understand this concept, 
of what we could call anthropomorphism. All right? Now, that's a huge word, anthropomorphism. But if you actually think about that word, anthropos is the word for human. And morphism is the idea of uh, giving structure. So, when we're talking about God, we a lot of times will use anthropomorphic language. And we're going to do that tonight. But the reason I say that is because this happens in a couple ways. One is people will read the Bible and they'll actually think ancient people thought that, that God was just a big man in the sky. And then the second thing that can confuse people is that maybe when they were little and they learned about God, they thought of God as a big man in the sky. But that's not actually what people, the ancient people thought that, that wrote the Bible. And that's not what we should think. And if you ever have thought that, you need to understand that the language of the Bible is anthropomorphic. When it talks about the arm of God, for example, is it literally saying that God is using his actual arm to do something? What it's actually talking about is his power and his interaction. And so how do you visualize that? Well, we use poetic or anthropomorphic language to say, okay, his arm. All right? The reason I bring that out is because I want to just dispel any misunderstandings people might have. And also, I have to frankly say, there actually have been cults out there. Like, there are people that actually teach. I had them come to my house once, and they said, God is just like a man. No, he's not. So you're going to see that tonight as we look at the Bible. He's not just a man in the sky. So I'll lay down some foundational attributes. And the first one, it is in your notes, is that God is eternal. God is eternal. And I have four letters here that are from the Bible. And this, right off the bat, shows you, when you begin to think about God being eternal, and these four letters, it says Y-H-W-H equals I am. I'm going to talk about that word in a second. But that right there shows you that God is not man. He's not human. We're not eternal, are we? <laughs> okay? Uh, we have a beginning. We have an end. God is eternal. Now... I'm going to show you where this concept comes from, but I want to actually just take a moment to think about something. I, I talked about how we have a beginning and the universe has a beginning. So a very hard thing for us to conceptualize is eternity. But, you know, in, in the past, and even today, there are some people who want to say, well, maybe the universe, rather than believing in God, maybe the universe is eternal. But there's actually a log logical problem with that. And that is that the universe, as we know in science, has something that's inherent in its nature, which is space and time, right? Space, time. And they're actually intertwined. Well, here's something that's been pointed out by people who've really thought about this stuff a lot. If you have an eternal past in the universe, how long would it take to get to the present? we would never get here. There, therefore, has to be something outside of space and time. If we're thinking about eternity, that gets us to the present. That could create a system with space and time that would be finite and allow us to have a starting point and a present and a future. And so the idea in the Bible is that there is an eternal reality, and that is God, He's outside of space and time. So some people will say, well, if the universe had to have a beginning, then God did too. No, the universe has space-time. God doesn't have that. He's not relegated to that. He's an eternal, uncaused, necessary being. And that's a lot to take in. So this is actually how uh, we see it in the Bible. And it's this word here, many of you probably are familiar with this, 
But it appears, this, this word here in the Bible, in the Old Testament, appears more than 6,800 times. And so let me give you the background on this word. Moses is talking to God, and he asks God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what should I tell them? I love this. This is, this is one of the most awesome things, right? God replies to Moses, you want to tell them who I am? I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. You want to understand God a little bit? Think about his name. And his name is I am. Now, what is that in Hebrew? It's these letters, and they respected the name of God so much that they didn't even include the vowels because of this idea of guarding his name and not pronouncing it in any way de uh, defacing uh, or taking his name in vain. And so, this is four letters, a tetragram, and instead of translating it directly, which as best we know, if you were to pronounce it, would be Yahweh, it has often been translated the way the Jews have tended to use the word, which we won't actually say his name, we'll just use the word Lord. So how is this often translated? Watch this, and I think a lot of you know this, but in your English Bibles, a lot of times it's L, it's a capital, but the also there will be small capitals for the rest of the letters. So if you see all capital letters for Lord, the translation is coming from those four Hebrew letters, which essentially are YHWH, Yahweh, and what that means essentially is He exists. He is. I am. He just exists. He is. He's absolute. So that's what the word Lord is really denoting. That's His name. And by the way, when it says, my name is the Lord, that's actually really going back to that, that word for I am. Not the word Lord. Now, you'll also see in the Bible... capital L, lowercase o-r-d, which is a translation of a different Hebrew word. I think some of you might know what it is. Anybody? Good guess, but it's not Elohim. I'm going to get to that word. What's the word for Lord in, in Hebrew? Adonai. Sound familiar? Adonai is the actual word for Lord. So if you see it this way, it, does, it can actually be translated. You know you're reading the direct translation, Lord. If you see it this way, you're actually reading the name of God. So pay attention to that. That is actually God's name. I am. So that's just a foundational idea, that God exists. He is. He's the uncaused cause. He doesn't need a cause the way the universe does. He doesn't need a beginning the way the universe does. He's not relegated to space-time. He is beyond it. Number two, God is powerful. Now, there's the word you mentioned. Elohim. And I believe it's, it's here in your notes. It denotes power because it actually means uh, mighty He is mighty, okay? So the word Elohim denotes uh, power, but also denotes plurality. So Elohim is another word related to God. But what's fascinating about this word is that the ending of it, I know, you know, we speak English, so we don't see it right away. But the ending of this word here is not what you would expect exactly. Because does anybody know what's interesting about the ending of this word? It's plural, right? So maybe you've heard the word cherub before. Cherub is an angel, type of angel, angelic being. What's more than one of them? Cherubim. 
We will show you that this word is not referring to multiple gods, though. This is referring to one God. And yet, there's a plural concept here. But it is the idea of mighty, uh, powerful. And we're going to see exactly what that means, that God actually determines and knows the future. He determines and knows, knows the future. So Elohim, he is supreme. All right? So God is eternal. God is powerful. We see that, by the way, again, when Moses is talking. The Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of the oppressors. I know about their sufferings, and there's nothing I can do, Moses. I'm sorry. Uh uh He says, I know about their sufferings, and I've come down to what? Rescue. Rescue. He can do that from the power of the Egyptians. By the way, if you know the story, God showed a little bit of power, Right? The power of the Egyptians. Do you think the Egyptians in the ancient world thought they were pretty powerful? Yeah, and did they think their gods were powerful, what they believed in? Yeah, but God had a way of showing not so much. Their power wasn't so great after all. He he has more power. And so to bring Israel from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God is powerful, and that's seen, for example, in the word Elohim. By the way, I don't think I put it, but it's often translated God. Elohim is often translated God. So when you read the word God, a lot of times you're actually getting it from the word Elohim. Number three, God is personal. And God says to Moses, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you when you bring the people out of Egypt. You will all worship me, worship God at this mountain. I will certainly be with you. And of course, he's saying he's going to give his presence with Moses, but he's also talking to Moses. That right there, I mean... You might just miss it, but it's like, wow, Moses is having this experience with God where he's in communication. That's the personal God. And then number four, God is good. God is good. This is actually one of the things that's hardest for people to really understand and accept. Because if God is powerful... If we do think God is powerful, then can't He do anything? And if God has the ability to do anything, then why does He allow this world with so much evil in it? Which I do think we need to talk about, and we will get to more. We are going to talk about that stuff more. But we do want to make it clear that the concept in the Bible is that God is good, And so God says to Moses, go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have paid close attention to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to you that I will bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites. So we see here an example of God's compassion. He sees that the people of Israel are in in bondage and slavery, and he wants to deliver them from their misery. The scripture in other places says that the one who does not love does not know God because God is what? Love. But interestingly, it's easy for us to to take things and, and, and say, okay, the Bible says God is love. Some people do this. Therefore, that's all there is to know about God. But in the same book of the Bible, that's 1 John, it says this, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is what? light now that doesn't mean literally he's light but you can see from the next phrase there is absolutely no what in him he is perfectly good light is a symbol right for goodness 
moral perfection. And there's no darkness in God. So understand God is love, which we would say is a good thing, right? Love is a good thing. However, you have to understand love with this idea of uh, perfection and morality. Otherwise, love could be redefined as something that's not very good. Okay? So God, when we talk about God being love, we're talking about it in the context of His goodness, His moral perfection. But again, it does present the, the, the problem, if God is powerful, why does, if He's love and if He's light, why does He allow evil? There is something I can say off the bat about that, and I, I want to cover that more sometime. But I did kind of point it out with C.S. Lewis before. That when you say, why is there evil in the world? You're actually making a statement that you may not realize. You're saying, if there's evil in the world, what are you really implying? That there's good. And if there's good and there's evil then there's a standard for that. And the question is, where does that standard come from? Is that a real standard? Is it actual? Or is it just us? The problem is if you say, well, it's not real, it's just us, we make the standard, then there's no real evil, and you don't actually have a problem. But the thing is, that argument always assumes there really is evil. So if you say there's really evil, then there's real good, or what C.S. Lewis called real just, this idea of being just, and if that's real, it has to come from something, a standard. Where does the standard come from? That gets us back to this idea of a moral lawgiver, something we all sense is the source of right and wrong. It comes from some reality out there. And that reality is God, which is what a lot of peop times people are trying to disprove by bringing out good and evil. There's really only good and evil with the idea of God in any absolute sense. Now, we'll need to talk more about that. And it is a good question. Why does God, if he's good, allow evil? We're only going to touch on that a little bit tonight. So those are four foundational things that are in your notes. God is eternal. God is powerful. God is personal. God is good. But I want to delve more deeply and, and pretty quickly to do a survey of other things the Bible says. We'll see how far we get here. But when we think about God, these are attributes. Sometimes they're called perfections of God. And there are two words that you're going to need to hold on to. The first word is incommunicable. That's a big word. Communicable, you may hear it a lot of times when we talk about communicable things, or maybe talk about communicable diseases, right? But incommunicable is something that is not going to, to uh, we're not going to have it. So these are attributes, incommunicable are attributes that are unique to God. We don't have these attributes in the way that God does. Now, there are different ways to categorize all of these things, but this is a classic way to do it, and it's been very helpful throughout history. The other attributes of God are what are called communicable attributes, and they are found within humans to some degree. And this, again, backs up my premise. Is God just some man in the sky? No. Biblically, he's not. And experientially, he's not. And logically, he's not. So here are some things that are unique to God. His independence. His independence. And here's a scripture uh, that I actually, it's not up here, but it's in your notes. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has also granted the Son to have life in himself. Where does God get his life? In himself. So it's, a, it's a concept that we, we, we can just so easily take for granted. You know, we, a lot of times as humans, we do take our lives for granted, don't we? And you kind of hear it come out sometimes in our entitlement. Well, why does life have to be this way? Well, here's the question. How did you even get here? How did you get here? Well, because of my parents. 
Did you really have control over that? And do you have the ability to sustain your life? I mean, we wish we could. We really wish we could just own our life, right, and, and live as long as we want. But we don't have that capacity. God, though, has life in himself. Acts 17, 25 is also in your notes. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, see, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. So all the life that we have, it comes from the source, the independent source of God. You do have life. And, and I love to think about these things because scientists, you know, we have pretty bright scientists today, don't we? I mean, we have really intelligent people. But ask them, you know, really grill them on it and say, where did we get life? And honestly, they have to say, we don't know. Well, we don't know if we're just saying we're going to put everything inside the box of Western science. But if we say, wow, we, we know there's life, and it's a miracle. There's no doubt about it. It comes from an independent source, a life giver. So the Bible says that's God. He gives life to all, and he has it in himself. The second one you have there is immutability. Immutability. Theologians just like to use as many big words as possible. Do you know what that means? If something's immutable, we have a teacher. It doesn't change. Again, some of these concepts are hard, but do you change? In, in, in some ways, you have to say yes, because you, did, you weren't always here. <laughs> you know, the universe doesn't depend on your existence. And your existence is dependent. The Bible says in James 1.17, James says, Every good and perfect gift is from, God, from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So there's a sense in which we can say, and these are very hard concepts to fully grasp, that God is unchanging. Again, He is. He is. That's immutability. Number three, it's not like us. He's a, this is in, incommunicable, is His eternity. And so in the book of Revelation, God says, I am the Alpha and Omega, that's the first and the last of the alphabet. Says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So now this is giving a little bit more uh, fleshing out of what I said before, that God is eternal. But it clearly says here, as an example of that, I'm Alpha and Omega. So God is beginning, God is at the end. And... The one who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, these, by the way, as you know, if you know the Bible, I'm giving you one or two verses. How many verses are there on these things? How much does the Bible say about some of these things? A lot. Okay? But I wanted to at least give you something that was printed so that you could see it. All right? So God is... He, 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 um, Part of his being is eternity. Then we have the words immensity and omnipresence. So where is God? Where is God? Okay. It's a really interesting thing. Is God in heaven? Is he here? <laughs> but you have to admit, sometimes we talk about being in the presence of God. Aren't we always in the presence of God? Yeah. So you can see why some of these concepts are, are confusing. Now, don't get this confused with other belief systems. Is God the same thing as the world around us? No. We, we as Christians, I'm talking, as Christians, we wouldn't say that God is here, like that he is actually this stand. This stand is its own thing. Now, God upholds it in existence, but he's separate from his creation. So, you see what I mean by everywhere? And here's the way the Bible puts this in Acts 17, Paul speaking. He did this so that they might seek God 
and perhaps he, he made everything the way it is so they would seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. So you're in existence right now. You, you live and move and have your being because God upholds that. He's not far from each one of us. He's right here. Do we always perceive it? That's really the question, isn't it? Now, a lot of you have, you know, everyone, has had the experience of uh, turning on the radio. And when you turn on the radio, do you hear anything? If you tune it right, you do. The interesting thing about that is it was already there, wasn't it? But when you tuned to it, you were able to perceive it. For whatever reason, there are times and there are situations where we have this ability as humans to be attuned and we experience God, but He's always there, whether we perceive it or not. He's always there. So that's His immensity, you know, that He, he is throughout all things. So what if you go to the farthest reaches of the universe? That's pretty far. God will still be there. And that word, omnipresence, you're going to, of course, see this a few times. Omni and presence, the idea of all present. So these are things we, you know, we don't really have this in the way that God does. These are things we can't as humans have. Unity. Hear or listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. How many gods? For Christians, what do we believe? And it's, it's, the, it's from the Jewish concept too. It's all throughout the Bible. There's one God. There's one God. And His essence is one in being. Now, does that mean that within God Himself there is no idea of relationship or love? No, because actually we see a little bit of hint here of plurality. But what we call this is unity or simplicity, oneness, that God is one in essence. So another way to put that is that Christianity believes in monotheism. We do not believe there are many gods. If anybody ha has the idea that Christians believe in more than one God, they have a misunderstanding of Christianity. Now, I mentioned this before. There was a girl at school re at recently who asked one of the teachers, I don't understand the concept of the Trinity. And I mean, what can you say other than welcome to the club, right? And we will get into that. But the Trinity even, that word that is the best word we could have come up with to describe what we read throughout the Bible, the last part of that word is very important. Yes, it does include the word try or the 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 uh, prefix tri, but the last part is trinity. And when you add that, you're saying one. So that's unity. One God. Number six is omnipresence. 1 John 3, 20b, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Now, that word omniscience you could probably break that down in your head right now you see the first part of that says omni okay that's that idea of whole all and what uh, science is knowledge okay so we think in our day we're pretty scientific right we have a lot of knowledge what science is always doing it's kind of like as you've gotten older did you ever think when you were young that you knew quite a lot did you ever get to a stage in your life where you thought you knew a lot? A lot of us do. We're like, hey, I know a lot, because we knew more than we did when we were young. But then at some point in your life, you start to learn so many things, you realize there's a lot I don't know. That's really what science tells us, that the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. <laughs> and so when God compares his knowledge to ours, it makes ours look so minuscule. 
And we know that we don't know a lot, if we're honest, in, in science. God has omniscience, if you want to put it that way, omniscience. And then another omni word, omnipotence, omnipotence. What does potent mean to you? Power. And what does Luke one thirty seven say? You have it there. Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. This idea of all-powerful. Now, we're going to look more at why, I, I've said this before, we're going to look at more why the world is the way it is, but it's like so many things when it comes to understanding Christianity, yet you have to, you have to start with some things before you can understand the next things. So, to, for right now, although this raises some questions, we know that God is powerful enough if we're granting what Christianity says, to create the universe, that's pretty powerful. But we'll have to look at why does the universe have the attributes that it has? Why do our lives have the experiences that they have? Christianity speaks powerfully to that. One more here. Perfection. The, the rock, Deuteronomy 32 says, his work is perfect. That's it's a, another concept for God. Why would a rock be a concept about God? Hmm? S stable and firm. Okay, because as you've noticed, humans, not so much. <laughs> you know, we try. But even if you say, I'm there for you, can you, re can you really say for sure? that you could always be there for someone? No, you really can't, can you? Our lives don't have that stability, but God's does. His work is perfect. All His ways are just. A faithful God without bias. He is righteous and true. And it says there right at the beginning, His, his work is perfect. Everything about Him there is this idea of perfection. I'm getting a lot of this, by the way, from a really uh, good uh, theology book from uh, Richard Mayhew and John MacArthur on uh, biblical theology, and they say God is the sum total of all conceivable perfections. God is the sum total of all conceivable perfections. It's interesting. There's, I talked about a guy who's a psychologist who's become very popular today, and I'm not saying that you should you know, listen to everything he says, but he, it's really fascinating that Jordan Peterson is his name, talks about the idea that we, we are, have the ability as humans to have an ideal of something. So can it, has anybody, have you ever heard anybody say, I, don't ha I never had the perfect father, right? What do you mean? What is a perfect father? We actually, right going on right now, we have a presidential candidate uh, in, in town here, someone who's, who's candidating. Do we want to have a good president? We long for it. We want the ideal. <laughs> Do we ever get it? Never! <laughs> and every time we trick ourselves, but this one will be it, right? No, no. We have the concept, we never have the reality. By the way, this is a side note. This is why as a Christian, I would say, as a Christian, I recognize that what we have in America is never going to be perfect. No matter how much we wish, it's never going to be perfect. And that's why as a Christian, what do I really say? And I think everybody who's here who believes would say this, we want Jesus to come. He's the ideal. Amen. The king of kings. See, even our presidents, in a way, are a king. They're a person of power. And we know we need that. There's an ideal there. But they don't meet the perfect ideal. 
And that's why Jesus is called the King of Kings. He is the ideal. God is all of our ideal. But when we think of the perfection of something, that's God. And I find it fascinating. We all have the idea of, of the ideal. And very quickly, when you talk to people, even atheists, when you talk about God, they, they grasp the concept. They may not agree with it, but they grasp it. So it's within us. We have an idea. And even the ancients, believe it or not, the ancients, so a lot of you, the comeback or, or the thought is, well, or, or, didn't they believe in many gods? Yes, there were people who believed in many gods. But even to them, there was one who could be over the other gods. The ideal. The God of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's God's perfection. That's a really good note to end on for tonight. And next week, we will talk some about God's communicable attributes. How we as humans actually possess attributes that are related to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can not only learn about you, but that we have the opportunity to know you, to experience you, because you are a God who is present, and you are a God who is active. You are a God who has chosen to reveal yourself and continues to work in human affairs. And Lord, what we've talked about tonight, I pray it would not be abstract. I pray that for each and every one of us, we would just realize we can enjoy that relationship with you the one who is good, the one who is perfect, the one who interacts with us personally. But I pray, Lord, that as Christians we would be filled with hope because we know we have a world that a lot of times wants to put its hope in political things. But we realize, Lord, while there is a place for politics, it is not the ultimate answer. The answer is found in your perfection. And our peace is never going to come in what humans offer. We, we acknowledge, Lord, peace can only be found in you. And for anybody out there, Lord, who doesn't know that peace, I pray, Lord, that they would find that in you because that is where the source of peace is. I pray that as we go through this Christian theology series that we as Christians would continue to learn and deepen our knowledge. But how I pray, Lord, that you would use what we talk about to reveal yourself and how people can have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord, for the theology that we're learning, but not because it's just interesting, but because of the realities that it holds. And I pray, Lord, it would draw us into the worship of you who deserves all of our honor and all of our worship. So thank you for this tonight. <clears throat> we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.